Mike Wilson from Morgan Stanley had been one of the most accurate analysts in 2020 with perfect timing at both the top and the bottom in the earlier part of last year. Recently, he has suggested that the market is overdue for a correction, stating excesses are clearly present and either prices must fall or go sideways, allowing for the moving averages to catch up. The speed at which the markets have moved up are unsustainable and he believes a drop is coming. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. No matter how accurate an analyst is or somebody who's a billionaire and had a lot of success, which I'll touch on in just a second, doesn't necessarily mean that the future will be whatever they say it is. They are always being asked on a daily basis, what's going to happen today? What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next year, 10 years, 20 years? It's so difficult to predict any of that because there are so many things changing all the time. But in saying that, we can look at what they present to us, see their track record, look at it, and get some good insight. It doesn't mean that if they say, all right, it's ripe for a correction, it's overdue, therefore we're just going to start shorting the market today, Mike Wilson said so. Not necessarily, but I do want to touch on what he had to say. He's looking at the 200-day moving average. I'll show you the chart in just a second. But the 200-day moving average, to give you some insight on this, has been and largely one of the most important indicators for those in the financial industry, the traders look at it, the algorithms are looking at it, as well as many influential people like Paul Tudor Jones. In fact, Paul Tudor Jones uses the 200-day moving average specifically as basically the cornerstone of his investing strategy. That's something I can get into in another video, but that's so important because you're talking about a guy who had been so successful year after year after year after year and you probably know his track record already but we're talking about ups and downs when the whole market is coming down the guy has been known to be there and actually be on top of the game that whole time he had done very well for for a long period so what he's saying with the 200 day moving average it's important that's all i'm trying to get to so i'm going to cover that at first then i'm going to look at several other indicators today and show you what's happening in the markets i got a lot to cover let's go Two pieces of information coming from Morgan Stanley. You could see right here the percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 above their 200-day moving average is just off all-time highs. There are certain things that we've got to pay attention to, and this is one of them. S&P 500 percentage of members greater than the 200-day moving average. The chart goes back from 91 up until the present, and we are in that territory again. You don't find this very often. Now, looking at this, you have to understand that it doesn't necessarily mean that a crisis is going to happen tomorrow, a collapse, a crash. No, I'm not saying that, but we are at historic highs. So what that means, as I mentioned in the introduction, is that you have this spike upward. You could have a correction which comes down, which sort of resets everything, or it could move sideways, allowing for the moving average to sort of start trending upward. We'll see what happens. We'll see what's going on. As I'll show you right here, the FANG stocks have not looked as good as they did before. And you're starting to see the Russell pick up quite a bit. The tech stocks certainly led the charge. After March, things were really, really going. The tech stocks were by far and large doing better than basically everything else. And then you look around the world as well. There's a lot going on today. So I'll show you more about that in just a second. Just a point that they make over here, not going to go into detail, short-term returns tend to lag normal when the percentage of stocks is greater than the 200 day moving average is at or above current level 92%. That's the left side. So you can see how they break it down by the timeline there. But on the right, they also say that and they lag with strong statistical significance. Look, when we're talking about the 200-day moving average, the 50-day moving average, the 100, any other indicator, in fact, you cannot put everything into that. But it is interesting to watch it because when you lose these moving in uh, moving indicators, you can kind of get an idea of the direction in which it has head over this period of time and use that to judge how it's doing 
against other indicators. So you get the moving average indicator moving against uh, all of the other ones, and you could see for yourself how fast this has gone up, how the significant drop it may have you know, encountered, whatever the case may be, it's just giving you an idea, and then you match that up with what's happening with the RSI. You look at other things that are going on, and that gives us sort of a sense of what's actually happening, not necessarily looking at the price is 50, the price is 1,000, because those are arbitrary numbers. You're not going to see it like that. You have to see it in its relative sense. I hope I made myself clear clear on that one. From Double Line, Jeffrey Gundlach does his regular presentations. There's a few charts that I wanted to show you here. Favorite assets in 2021 from the list provided below. Please select your favorite on the left and least favorite on the right. Asset classes for 2021. They're actually pulling this from Deutsche Bank, everybody's favorite. But anyway, on the left-hand side, you could see that's comparing December 2020 to December 2019, and uh, the darker blue color there, that's 2020. So you could see how things have changed over the year. I'm not necessarily going to go into all of those, but there is something very clear. Look at U.S. equities on the top. We're talking about 23% versus 18% back in 2019. Of course, they love US equities, emerging markets as well, European, not so much. But it's just interesting to see how much focus has been specifically on the US when we're looking at the, the equities. There's no doubt about it. I mean, their performance speaks for itself. But you look around the world, and not many others have done quite as well. World GDP forecasts by year. This just shows you year over year. They're claiming, claiming that there will be significant growth throughout 2021. The percentage that they're using here, 5.2%. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but here you go. This one tells it all. TSA Travelers, 2020, 2021 versus one year ago, down significantly. Now, we are obviously off the bottom. There's no doubt about that. But to compare where it was at the beginning of 2020 to today, it's significant. You know what's going on in the airline industry. The manufacturers of these aircraft, they're hurting bad. You look at what's happening with the, you know, everything. I've covered it 100 times before. All of the things in the line are really suffering as a result. And we keep seeing the data that continues to show up. And it's showing the same thing. It's a depressed industry right now. And doesn't look like it's going to come back in 2021. The global money supply, I mean, here you go. As of January 11th, they're showing right here, $95 trillion. $95 trillion. Congratulations. It is just unbelievable, unbelievable, the amount of money that's floating around in this system in different forms. If you look at what's going on with the central banks, you look at what's happening with you know the actual governments and what they've been doing. It's all done the same no matter where you go. Okay, there are variances. One is going to do it this way. One is going to do it that way. But there's an expansion happening. There's a massive expansion. And the more they do this, the less of an effect it has, just like the alcoholic, just like the drug addict. The more you give, the more you got to give. And that eventually puts them into a corner, which they're in right now. And they realize that this is ultimately meant for destruction, where I will go off in my own corner here to suggest to you is basically this is being done on purpose but don't let my opinion get in the way attack of the zombie corporation percentage of u.s small cap groups with interest greater than profits for at least three years so you can see right now back to the levels you know just about of what we saw during the dot-com boom and bust where everyone said oh my goodness that was crazy how do we ever let that happen i mean it was so obvious and now today many of the indicators have surpassed it this was interesting because you look at what's going on in the u.s as it relates to the stock market and then you look at the market globally excluding the u.s 
This is specifically talking about the CAPE cyclically adjusted PE ratio. Global equities are half a bargain. So the cycle adjusted PE CAPE ratios being measured right here, the blue line, that's the US, MSCI, and then the global X excluding the U.S. And look at what has happened over these years. I mean, the chart goes back from 1980, as you see. But I mean, right away, since the financial crisis, things have really changed. And we could see that here on this chart. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you put your money into these you know, global stocks, excluding the U.S., that you're going to do well because they're uh, less valued at this point. Not necessarily, but it's just good to know. Here you could see FANG stocks that are going back to levels we haven't seen since early November. There have been a few of the stocks, the tech stocks, not necessarily just the FANG stocks, but some of the tech stocks, which have been beaten down a little bit here over the last, let's say, month or so. And that just shows you that what we're experiencing is some rebalancing of the portfolios. That's what's taking place. Fed's Esther George cautions that inflation could rise faster than expected. My goodness, could we get some truth out of the Fed? Well, let's take a look. Inflation could rise faster than some might expect as the economy recovers from the current issue. The central bank official said that current inflation measures are being held down by certain sectors that could rebound quickly. Well, we don't know what's going to happen, of course, and I don't think that the inflation is necessarily being caused by this. I think their activities are actually doing this and it's all pent up and certainly you need to point the finger somewhere. If you see the actions of the Federal Reserve, the more they do, obviously the less of an effect it has, we know that. But more importantly, if you dig deep, dig deep, you got to do this. You got to dig deep. I've shown it here on the channel. I've documented here on the channel. What they are doing is not directly monetizing the debt but they are basically doing it, you know, you can call it directly if you want, because they use their friends, they are actually actively engaging in this by putting one of the big financial companies in between, they buy it up, they are cycling this garbage around. I mean, I showed you the details, I don't have them in front of me now, but they are basically doing that. And that's what happens to the money supply, to the valuation of the currencies, and as it relates to basically real goods, food, energy, and so on. You've got big problems right now, and the central banks are absolutely behind it. Wall Street visionaries provide chilling views on the next big risk. I would highly recommend checking out this article. It's really long and detailed. And of course, there's a lot of opinions around it. But they do get into some factors I think are important. We're talking about people from Bridgewater and others out there who are definitely people that you know, you might want to pay attention to. I think it is interesting to see their perspective, give you some facts around that, some details that they provide as well. Post haste, office towers struggle for relevancy as workers get comfortable at home, but will the trend last? Companies have other ideas. Companies are eager for staff to return to the office, workers not so much. So there's a real battle going on, but let me tell you right now, with the big offices downtown, everywhere in the cores, you are seeing the high rises and so on. They are largely empty today. Now that might change, of course, we'll see what happens, but I mean, there's only only so long you can do this for. They're paying the leases on these places and a lot of them are simply saying, we don't need as many people. We're going to get rid of some of these floors. What's going to replace them? We don't know. What I thought was interesting was I heard Gary Vaynerchuk just say this and you may know of who he is, but it doesn't matter. What we're looking at right now is that individual companies as, as it relates to corporations, their virtual 
let's say, real estate, their virtual real estate is becoming more important than their actual physical real estate. So essentially, where they occupy a lot of the their different niche, whatever it might be, financial industry, uh, if it's specifically with, with stocks, maybe they're a hedge fund, or maybe they're uh, McDonald's and so on, their actual virtual real estate is becoming more and more important to get those views, to get the likes, to get the attention on them. So I think that's just something that I wanted to just put an idea into your head. And uh, l- let me show you this. Look at what's happening. Russia, Russia for the first time holds more gold than US dollars in $583 billion reserves. Well, if you remember what happened not that long ago, where Russia was getting rid of a lot of their treasuries. They were selling off a bunch of these, and they actually dropped off the list of the major foreign holders of treasury securities. So you know what's happening. Now, there are many reasons why they're doing this. There is, of course, this back and forth that's been going on, not so nice uh, tensions that's been taking place for years and years. So they have a reason in that way. The US dollar was strengthening, so they don't necessarily want to be purchasing more of those. And of course, they may see gold as being more international. If they're facing sanctions and so on, they can use the gold if they desire, but they've been certainly adding to that portfolio that they have over and over and over again. Gold made up 23% of the central bank stockpile as of the end of June. So thing, things have really, really changed here over the last, let's say, 20 years in this country. There's no doubt about it. So the chart at the bottom there just corresponds to that information. This article here is talking about the tariffs that were placed on China. China retaliated, placed them on the US, and so on. Economists who crunched the numbers were surprised to find that Chinese exporters generally didn't lower prices to keep their goods competitive after the tariffs were imposed. That meant the US duties were mostly paid by its own companies and consumers. See, the problem here is that there might be something that some believe is a good idea and it doesn't work out well. In this case here, clearly, you look at what happened with the the trade balance. I mean, clearly that the US is in a worse situation now than previously as it relates to that. The tariffs led to an income loss for the US consumers of about $16 billion annually in 2018. Another own goal tariff Uh, tariffs on imports from China tended to reduce U.S. exports. That was because globalized supply chains mean manufacturing is shared between countries and the U.S. raised the cost of its own goods by levying duties on imports of Chinese components. And then it goes on to just to say companies which together account for 80% of the U.S. exports had to pay higher prices for Chinese imports. So that's a problem, of course. This is the way it is. You put a tax on the company, if it's even a local company doing everything locally, you put a tax on them, they will simply increase the price that the customer has to pay. That's the way it is. That's the way it goes. That's why you see companies, they are getting higher tax. They're going to move to Florida. They're going to move to lower cost places to do business. That's just the way it is. It doesn't resolve anything. There are fundamental reasons why these things are happening. And if you don't resolve those issues, you just have a problem and ultimately the consumer gets screwed over. That's all for this video. If you found it informative, hit that thumbs up button. If you hate it, give it a thumbs down. If you want to learn about e-commerce, you can do so at the amazongps.com for free. If you want to understand the financial system from top to bottom, very simply, very easily, you can do so at the link in the description. And hold on a second, hold on. Have you seen this? It's a little mini documentary that I recorded. You definitely want to check it out if you haven't already. Click it. I'll see you there.